Hello everyone and welcome to this video where we discuss pulse code modulation or PCM for audio and video compression. First of all, PCM is extensively used in digital audio systems and there are a few very well known examples like the audio CD format and WAV files which utilize linear PCM typically with 16 bits per sample, stereo channels and assembly rate of 44.1 kHz which is also the standard for audio CD quality. Another significant application of PCM is in the telecommunications domain through the use of the G711 codec, which has been developed by the telecommunications group of the ITU. And this codec compresses narrow band speech using either A law or micro law, and it represents each sample with eight bits, and the sampling rate is eight kilohertz. And this results in a bitrate of 64 kilobits per second. And although this standard has been developed in the 1970s already, G711 is still widely used today, particularly in the voice over IP and in the ISDN application. Now let's take a look at the general encoding scheme of PCM for speech. The signal first undergoes a band limiting filter then micro-law encoding is applied with a subsequent linear PCM. And when this signal is converted back to a digital signal at the decoder, the output is typically containing a staircase-like signal that might also have some high frequency noise. And this is the reason why after the micro-law expansion, a low-pass filter is applied to the reconstructed signal to filter out uh, this noise. At the next slide, we see some typical data rates for audio applications. And here it is important to keep in mind what target application we are focusing on. For example, an audio CD uses a frequency band of 20 Hz up to 20 kHz because we want to capture music in the entire human auditory domain. For telephone applications, however, we want to capture speech, which happens in the range of about 85 Hertz to 8 kilohertz, but the fundamental voice frequency are much lower, namely from about 85 Hertz to 255 Hertz, and only specific parts such as consonants and sounds of S, T and F, for example, are in the 2 kilohertz to 8 kilohertz region, which is not fully covered by the optimized narrowband telephone standard, as we can see here, but it contained the essential components of human speech, at least. You might wonder why DVD audio uses an oversampling with 96 kHz. And the main reason for this is to get a more accurate representation of the signal with smoother waveforms, reducing the staircase effect. But there are also other reasons, like for example, the intermodulation effects, where a combination of higher frequency above 20 kHz lead to an audible lower frequency that would not be captured otherwise. According to the Nyquist theorem, for all these applications, the sampling rate is at least twice as high as the maximum frequency component, as you can see in this table. Now let's discuss differential coding of audio. Differential coding is introduced to address inefficiencies in the basic PCM. And the idea here is to take advantage of temporal redundancies between consecutive samples, which are often very, very similar. So instead of encoding the absolute values of each sample, we encode the differences between them, and this reduces the amount of data to be transmitted or stored, since smaller values can be represented with much fewer bits. In this slide, we also see how assigning shorter code words to frequently occurring values and longer code words to less frequent ones allow for more efficient encoding. And this is a key concept in audio compression algorithms. The next slide shows how differential coding can lead to more efficient storage or transmission. The histogram of sample values shows a concentration close to zero, but still a wide range of possible values. In the histogram of consecutive differences, however, we see a much stronger focus around zero, with a much more narrow distribution, which can be much more efficiently encoded because uh, fewer bits can be assigned to common difference values and thereby optimizing the compression. Now, what is predictive coding? The idea here is to predict the next sample based on the previous sample or samples. 
and then encode only the difference or the error between the predicted and the actual values. This error, also known as the prediction error, is what gets transmitted or stored because the decoder will also perform the same prediction afterwards and we only need to know the error. A particular problem here, however, is that the dynamic range of the prediction errors might be larger than the original signal and this can happen when the prediction is less accurate, of course. The simplest form of predicted coding uses the previous sample to predict the next one or current one and the prediction error is then the difference between the actual sample and the predicted value. So that means f hat sub n equals f sub n minus 1 and the error would be e sub n equals f sub n minus f hat sub n. A more advanced predictor uses a combination of several preview samples and adapts the coefficients based on the input signal to make a more accurate prediction. And an example for this is shown in the formula below here with the coefficients a sub n k or a sub n minus k where we could give less importance to samples farther in the past. So this could also be considered as an exponential moving average value. And this of course gives a much better prediction in some situations where the current value is not only similar to the previous one. We could also draw a schematic figure for this process, as we can see on this slide, where the input sample f sub n goes into the predictor that computes f hat sub n and subtracts it from the input sample to get error e sub n. On the receiving side, the predictor uses the same mechanism for the prediction and the transmitted error to reconstruct the original signal. So we use the transmitted error and f hat n, which we predict from the previous reconstructed sample value f sub n. It is also important to understand here that the predictor must maintain a history of previous samples to generate accurate predictions if we want to use more than one reconstructed value for our prediction. Now let's continue with differential PCM. The idea of DPCM is to use predictive coding but integrate an additional quantizer step for the prediction error. Unlike the pure predictive coding, this scheme does not guarantee lossless reconstruction due to the quantization step since the prediction is based only on a reconstructed quantized value. However, DPCM is often used in applications where a small amount of loss or distortion can be tolerated, such as telephony or low bitrate audio streaming. And of course, the main advantage here is that we save some bandwidth. How DPCM works is shown on the next slide, where we can see that the prediction error E sub n is quantized by using a quantization table or list, resulting in a lossy error E tilde sub n. And this quantization error is transmitted using code words with entropy coding techniques, like Huffman coding, for example, where frequent values get short code words and less frequent values get long code words. The coder-decoder process of differential PCM produces a reconstructed quantized signal value, which includes a combination of the predicted value and the quantization error. A common metric now for evaluating the quality of this reconstructed signal is the distortion, which is defined as the average squared error between the original signal value and the reconstructed one. For speech, quantization steps can be modified adaptively by estimating the mean and the variance of the signal patches and this allows us to minimize the overall quantization error across several samples. There is also an improved version of DPCM called Adaptive Differential Pulse Code Modulation or ADPCM which extends the idea of DPCM by adapting the coder to the input signal. This is achieved by modifying the quantizer, so using different quantization tables, for example, and the predictor, which would work differently for different streams of values, such that they consider the input but also the output and the error of previous encodings. So, for example, we could vary the length of the signal sequence that is considered for the prediction 
but we could also use different quantization tables according to the value range of the signal values or the produced errors in the past. The schematic diagram in this slide shows you the process of ADPCM for the G726 codec. Here the input is a 64 kilobits per second micro low encoded PCM value, which is converted to uniform format and then used for an adaptive quantizer that computes a 32 kilobits per second quantization error by considering the prediction value f hat m, which is predicted from the previous reconstructed quantized signal value f tilde n. The inverse process is then used at the decoder below, which uses the same adaptive predictor and converts the reconstructed signal back to a 64 kilobits per second micro low encoded PCM output. And this is the end for this video. Thank you very much for watching.